politics and above religion, a moral authority exists known globally as the ageless wisdom. It is the study of consciousness, the mystery of awareness, which cannot be measured, yet will not be denied. Ageless Stay tuned as we explore consciousness, the fundamental nature of reality. Welcome to the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School with Michael Banner. Hey, thanks for joining us today for the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School on 90.7 KPFK in Los Angeles. Serving all of Southern California, from Santa Barbara to San Diego, from the ocean to the desert, and live streaming for the world at kpfk.org. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, thank you. We do podcast. We even post to YouTube. But if you can come by on Tuesday afternoons at 1.00, to the broadcast or uh, the live stream on the internet. We really appreciate that. Join the group mind. Let's do this together whenever we can. What a joy to have uh, a dear friend with us today, someone who I've lost track of how many times I've interviewed this gentleman on the radio here on KPFK over the years and uh, way back in the day at other uh, radio stations. So his name may be familiar to you. If not, you're in luck. This is going to be a grand adventure, a real quest. Indeed, that's sort of the topic we're going to talk about today is the sacred quest and uh, the hero's journey. And, and what is that really all about? What is this longing that everyone has, this yearning to understand to find ourselves and figure out what life's about. That's, that seems to be embedded. It's like uh, we're hardwired to pretty quickly in life, don't you think? Look beyond earning and spending. That's what gets us going as teenagers and young adults to get established. You want to buy a car, right? And then you want to get into a relationship and get a good career going. And, you know, then you take on a couple of big loans and uh, you're off and running. And before long, it's uh, a veritable, uh, well, you know, the figure of speech, the rat race, the treadmill. So what is there beyond producing and consuming? Media and, and the so-called establishments done a pretty good job of teaching us to be consumers. And that preoccupies our attention a lot. But you know... You know, especially as a listener to this radio station and this program, that there's got to be something else. So we go off on that search. Today I've uh, invited a guide to at least help us get our feet on the path and head off down the road in what is a wondrous and exciting, sometimes frightening and, uh, and terrible uh, you know, there are, there are the peaks and valleys in, in life. But in time, the larger view makes it a grand adventure. And so this is a fellow adventure. My friend, for many years, we were just adding up on our fingers how many years, and we ran out of fingers and toes. Guy Finley from beautiful Merlin, Oregon, is my guest today. And Guy, good afternoon. How nice to see you again. And Michael, how good to see you and hear that voice again and uh, kind of find shelter in that resonance. It's, it's nice to see you and nice to hear you. Well, thanks for uh, continuing to do your good work to write and to teach and to speak. And I know your whole intention in moving to Merlin was uh, use the word refuge, I think. Did I hear you right, or is that just in my own mind? Didn't you just say refuge? <laughs> <laughs> in part, definitely it was. Well, but my point being that someone like you needs time alone or time with family and close friends, but then you always come out and you you teach continually, and you've written more books, I think. Do you have any idea how many books you've published? Not, not really anymore. I know that if you added books and the 
audio books, it would be well over 50. I know that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. So that's just remarkable. And each one is a jewel. There really are gems. And my bookshelf is full of Guy Finley books. Now, today, we want to talk about a special project that you've been working on, I dare say, all your life, a kind of a compendium. Uh, You call it uh, The uh, Seeker, the Search, and the Sacred. Is that right? That's correct. Tell me a little about how this came together for you. You know, it goes so far back in one respect, I won't bore the listeners with the details of my own continuing journey. But back in, I guess it was in the late 70s, I had the the opportunity, really, as far as I'm concerned, the blessing to meet a man who, in retrospect, because I had just come back, I had gone to... I'd gone around the world twice, uh, dusting people's feet with my forehead, hoping that someone would give me a shakti pot of some kind and pop me open, and then I wouldn't have to do any work at all. I just, I'd revel in this great character that I thought I was, you know. And uh, when I got back home on second trip, I was was very disappointed because I realized that what I was looking for didn't exist. And it was right at that time that by one of those incredible strangely synchronistic events uh and it's more strange than we have time to go into i i met uh, a, a a true christian mystic his name was vernon howard and i spent the next 15 years working side by side with this man uh and at that time before he died i had i had been fascinated with a work of his own called the mystic master speak which was a compilation of quotations from masters past and present on topics. But in my own heart and mind, I thought to myself, well, it doesn't really tell a story. Can I do something similar to that at some point in my life? And I could tell the story of the singularity of a unity that runs through all of the teachings East and West. Is that, can that be found? Because I thought it would be a great service, not just for myself, but that if that were capable of being done, that then men and women who were aspirants might begin to grasp this idea that not only is there a, a trail, a journey that this that the hero, the divine calls us to, but that we've all been walking it without knowing it. So that's what the book is. It's a, a book of, comp, of essays and the compilation of the voices of masters through the ages, all are which intended to point to a single idea. And the single idea is this, that we are born with what I call a divine dissatisfaction. And that no matter what we try to find in this world, if we're an aspirant, we've realized the world is not going to give us. If it could have, it would have, and it didn't. So now I must look somewhere else. Where do I look? I become a, a, a spiritual student. I become someone looking in the invisible world instead of the visible one. And that's a very important distinction. Because that means I have to look within myself to find what I couldn't find outside of myself. And so the seeker begins. He goes on this search, like the prodigal son left home and looked for a way to make his own life in his own image and realized at some point that while I'm capable of doing this, I'm starving, meaning my soul is not nourished and I must return home because at least I had there what I don't have now. And so he returns home and he makes a loop what seems to be a circle, and he returns to his father's home. In many ways, that's the seeker, the search, the sacred. We have in us a divine dissatisfaction. It sends us on a journey. The journey produces a whole plethora of experiences, and the experiences gradually prove to be inadequate to the task again. I I, I mean, how many insights, how many mystical experiences, speaking for myself, could I possibly have before I realize that the experience itself isn't actually changing anything by itself. It proves there's something to be done and to see, but it doesn't change the core of the consciousness. So then the seeker goes through this next journey where he has to begin to realize that knowledge is not the answer, but it must lay someplace else, and it does indeed, in another level of his or own consciousness that can't be accessed by thought. And so he begins this process of giving himself up for the sake of the love that started him on the journey 
And then he finds out the love that started him on the journey was already waiting for him to come back home into this new interior awareness whose light actually changes the consciousness by illuminating it, bringing more and more into this consciousness so there's no longer the sense of separation. And when the sense of separation is gone, lo and behold, the divine dissatisfaction has been answered because the thing we're looking for is unity, love, relationship, something that is not corrupted or divided and doesn't set me against something or even for something because it's all innate. Sorry for the long answer, but that was a... <laughs> a bit of a journey of its own. Yes, it was. I hear you, though, loud and clear. Um, uh, polls I've seen, Guy, indicate that about 40%, I think this is a remarkable number, and there are several polls that point at this, of American adults now consider, and it's a growing number, now consider themselves spiritual but not religious. I was raised in a religious home. Not only did it not resonate for me, I found it, by the time I was 12 or 13 years old, to be abusive. And I was raised in a rather dysfunctional family and suffering enough abuse at home. And then to go to church and to be told how bad I was and responsible for this man who's still hanging on the cross. This was the Catholic Church. They never took Jesus off the crucifix. He's still up there as a reminder that it's my fault that the Son of God is uh, suffering so. And I got that message over and over, and I had to go to confession, and I didn't have anything to confess because I was a pretty good kid, so I had to make stuff up. Yeah, <laughs> I could just hear it. And I thought, well, this is ridiculous, you know. And then the priest started asking me about my impure thoughts, and I thought, these thoughts are not impure. <laughs> not to my way of thinking. This is a normal teenager mm -hmm. growing up, and basically I'm out of here. And wanted nothing to do with religion, and yet that longing, that urge that you're talking about for something subtle, for something meaningful, that uh, an, an urge that I felt in my heart and that my head did not allow me to access... I think what you're saying about thinking does not do it is such an important point. This is a path of the heart. Talk about that a bit, if you would. Yeah, you know, just quickly, we, we have a very similar history, which doesn't surprise me. It was after I had been baptized, then went to Catholic Church, then went to rabbinical school because half of my family was Jewish, and around the age of 13, before I was supposed to be bar mitzvah, I went to my parents. I said, I can't do this. I don't, I don't believe in any of it. None of it's any good. The most angry people I've ever met in my life are trying to tell me about love. Please, it doesn't work. Let me go. And they did. God bless them. They, they let me start a journey that began with, as much as yours did, with the negation of mechanical religion because something wanted to affirm something that mechanical religion couldn't touch, let alone all of the, the, uh, the icons and the, the, the dogma connected to all of that. So th I just wanted to share that with you because that's something we definitely have in common. So now the next part, and I'll be as brief as I can. We are, as human beings, an, a creature of nature. Nature has made this body but nature has made this body in the image of something and not the way people think, you know, the image of God. Some fellow, as VH used to say, sitting on a cloud dangling his feet over. But as the, the, the Elohim, as the, as the unity of all of these forces expressing themselves through creation and giving birth to creation. In our heart of hearts, we are very much not just a creation, but a participant in it. But on one hand, this animal... It loves herds. We want to be part of the group. And that doesn't just mean the, the, the uh, social, political, religious affiliations. That means that our thoughts themselves want to run in herds and want to find corresponding thoughts so that we can feel safe and secure in the company of similar thought. But thought can't do anything. 
If we want to know what's wrong with the world, it's because too many people are trying to think how to fix it. It can't be fixed with thought. So we, we, we gradually are culled from the herd by the divine. We recognize I can't run with thought. And to the point of what you asked, it's a solo journey. And we as human beings now don't even know what it means to be actually an individual. I find myself in the mirror of my culture, in the mirror of religion, in the mirror of the social values. And I look there and the part of me that's looking never stops measuring itself according to what it should be or shouldn't be. Much like the priest asks you, what are your impure thoughts? You know why they ask these questions? Because they're, they, they, they're, their, they're afraid of their own nature. Everybody basically is afraid of their own nature because we don't understand it. This journey is a journey into entering into, realizing, and then recognizing who and what we are is exactly what we are meant to be moment to moment if we can accept the guidance that comes in that revelation. There are teachers, like I'm thinking, uh, pretty sure it was Joseph Campbell that is known for saying, follow your bliss. And it, intuitively, it seems like if we're going to search for love, if we're going to find that path, we should search for a loving feeling. What I have found, what many teachers have shared with me, is that search for love, for light, for understanding, for kindness and compassion and wisdom, truth, uh, all these qualities of love or consciousness involves facing a shadow side and uh, confronting the demons that live within us. I'd like you to speak about that as well. I think it's a pretty important distinction because tying into what we just said, it really isn't so much confronting the demons, the shadows, the qualities and characteristics that because we have been taught as all of us were, a good person doesn't have hatred. A good person is compassionate. A good person shares his cake with his brother at the dinner table. And if you're not a good person, you're a bad person. And if you're a bad person, then you're gonna get punished. This runs very deep in this consciousness. It's not just my family or your family, it's the whole of human consciousness. And this is the first thing that I help prove in this book, is that it's not my pain, it's not Michael's pain. It's not Doreen's fear. It's not Patricia's fear. It is our pain and our fear. It belongs to a consciousness that is completely conditioned at this point to believe that it should not be what it is. I want let that sink in. Our consciousness is conditioned to believe that it shouldn't be the content of itself. So it's at war with itself. It never stops judging itself or judging others, which is much more convenient. But the task becomes, as one sees, the futility of being at war with myself, this innate conflict between want and not want, who I should be, who I shouldn't be, that that innate conflict eventually brings a person to a recognition the task here isn't for me to try to overcome these things. How ludicrous for me to try to overcome anything at all when the part of me I'm trying to overcome is being, try, is, is being attempted to be overcome by me. I mean, it's just a war. So instead of confrontation, it becomes illumination. And we move from the, the, the futility of hoping that I'm going to save myself into the understanding that the light that understands and recognizes these qualities, it isn't afraid of the quality. It changes my relationship to it the minute I see that this isn't something that's wrong with me, it's just something I don't understand yet. That's it. And as that understanding grows in, in, in relationship to the illumination that one is capable of having, so does the fear and the anger and all the rest of that start to go away. And then we have a completely different relationship to life because we see it through new eyes. I've been thinking for many, many years about... I can only use my words for this, that so-called higher consciousness or expanded awareness carries with it, apparently, a, a set of exalted values or ethics. And I certainly am not implying any sense of superiority. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for it's really quite a humbling experience to begin to truly understand yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who you are, the spiritual yeah. being in this animal body and and being pulled in both directions. I yes. feel like the, the rope in a tug of war sometimes. Yeah. Quite accurate, actually. But I, I've never been able to find anyone to comment on this uh, intrigue for me that a lie detector works because being untruthful is stressful to the body. And doesn't that imply or suggest something wonderful about us, that even the, the most unrealized, crudest, meanest, most narcissistic, self-centered SOB will trigger a lie detector when he, when, when he lies, his yeah. body is horrified. I love this. By the fact that he's lying. Yes. Why don't you riff on that, <laughs> riff on that a little bit? <laughs> That's fantastic. It doesn't change just because I'm not connected to a lie detector. I live, <laughs> I live in a life detector. I live in the presence of a light detector. All day long, but we have a this mind divided as it is and conditioned again with the fear of itself immediately finds the, the consolation of justification for the quality of character expressed in the moment. Instantaneously. I can't say something that's cruel without knowing that they deserved it or I had to save myself from something bad that was going to happen to me. Every thought that comes out of my mouth that is a lie because it is the projection of a consciousness afraid of life. Real consciousness is not afraid. Life isn't afraid of life. That's insane. But I have all of these innate fears of relationships rejecting me, taking me away from what I believe I have to have. And when that consciousness acts, it covers its own act with an instantaneous set of explanations to ensure that what it has done is backed up by the content of all the reasons why it had to be that way. So we never experience the pain. We're never present to the conflict in our own consciousness because that consciousness covers itself up instantaneously. Really an important point. Love the conversation. Well, congratulations. You're the first person to give me a cogent response to that. And I've talked to quantum physicists and philosophers and brain researchers, and uh, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I'd love to pursue that further with you sometime. Listen, uh, we have to take a short break, but when we come back, I want to talk more about this wonderful new book. And um, also, you have a seminar coming up, right? Yes. So we wanna, is that going to be online as well as in Oregon? Yes, and never so quickly. I'm going to be giving a special series of talks over three days from June, I think, the uh, 21st to the 24th or 24th to this one. We can, I'll get the dates clear before we come back. And it's online. And, Michael, I'm talking online three times a week now for free all over the world. I went online when COVID started, and it, the, the message is being received globally in a way I couldn't have imagined, to tell you the truth. And so this seminar will be in person for people who want to come to the foundation, and it'll also be online. Author, teacher, speaker, an all-around nice guy, Guy Finley, my guest today on KPFK. And we'll be right back. There's lots more right after this short break. Stay with us. Support comes from Pasadena Playhouse, presenting Uncle Vanya, a modern revival of Anton Chekhov's classic masterpiece, running June 1st through June 26th. After years of caring for their family's crumbling estate, Vanya and his niece receive an unexpected family visit. This translation of Uncle Vanya provides an up-close, contemporary encounter with this enduring drama. For further information on Pasadena Playhouse's production of Uncle Vanya, visit Pasadena Playhouse playhouse.org or kpfk.org. My guest today on the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School program here on KPFK is Guy Finley. I first interviewed Guy, um, well, I first met Guy literally 40 years ago 
and he was a protege of a mystic named Vernon Howard, who I was interviewing at the time. And uh, Vernon passed away. Guy went off on his own. We stayed in touch. He's a very prolific author, dozens and dozens and dozens of books. He's very generous with his time. He does, as he was saying before the break, these uh, online presentations, absolutely free. Uh, books and audio books and uh, he has a seminar coming up, a webinar seminar. I believe besides being online people can actually come to Merlin and participate and sit with you, right? Very, mu very much so. We have a beautiful 15 acre piece of property with old growth sugar pine with a beautiful main building in it. Men and women come from all over the world. Of course, COVID kind of kicked everybody's you know what uh, but now it's starting to pick up again. And so my presence online is free, nothing to join, and people can come to the foundation. And even if you come for the three-day uh, workshop, the what do we call it, uh, an intensive, which is called The Seeker, The Search, The Sacred, The Hero's Journey, um, it's only, I think it's twenty four ninety five for three days. I want people to, look, Vernon gave me everything that he gave me basically for free, never asked me for anything. How can I do other than that? Truth gives itself freely. We must give ourselves freely as far as I'm concerned. So it helps if people make donations, no question about it. And we have to charge a little bit of money or we'd, we wouldn't have a building. But uh, apart from that, everything is come and join us. And if you can't, there's a scholarship and we'll get you there anyway, period. Guy, in the personal development field, much is made of the importance of setting a goal, having a clear, specific objective in mind. Uh, Stephen Covey in his uh, popular Seven Habits book talks about the need to begin with the end in mind. Mm. We're talking about the seeker, the search, and the sacred. To have a direction for this search seems we may need some sort of objective or goal. Would you define that? What should we look for? How should we set our sights? Yeah, that's an age-old question. And uh, as best I'm able to answer it and remain, for me, it's always encouraging, but to, so that the listeners can share in this idea. I said earlier that our, our lives, as they presently are, for the most of us, are, are basically transfixed with the physical because through a relationship between myself and what I seek or want, hope to acquire, there is a constant sensation of, I'm not quite complete, but I will be when I achieve this goal. So we set out as we're educated, really conditioned to do, to try to become someone through something outside of ourselves. In the end, that's a journey into futility because as everyone knows, if we're willing to see it at all, Every time I get to the end of what I thought would set me free, I'm actually a little more encumbered because now I have to carry with me all of this. I have to protect it. And if I'm not protecting it, then I feel, I fear I will lose what I have made of myself. But the root of this is that you can't lose what God has made of you, what the divine has made of you. It's timeless. So we set out on this journey in time because you and I knew Mr. Howard and, and you, we both loved him. Here's a little tribute to VH. He said, it is wise to seek immortality because time defeats all other ambitions. It is wise to seek immortality because time defeats all other ambitions. I was just talking yesterday on Sunday, as I do live, and I, I spoke that the great unseen predator that takes everyone down is passing time. And when we look for our lives in the conditions that appear in passing time, including what time says we must do in time in order to be a successful human being, we start out with a mistaken understanding of how to find ourselves, but not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That journey educates me. Like my music career, which we don't need to talk about. I was very successful. First white soft rock artist, Motown Records, writing musical scores for motion pictures, TV, home in Malibu with a tennis court, the whole nine yards. And there I am one day at home beating my head on the piano 
because the thing that was going to free me, which I, I love music, became my captor because now I had to keep everything in place. And I'm starting to wonder, how did I wind up in prison that was supposed to be my liberation? And then as all of these things do, and that's what I'm saying, the journey educates. The journey is not to achieve. The journey is to see and receive understanding through it so that gradually I'm liberated from my own desires because I see the desires are in things seen, hoped for. And as St. Paul says, who hopes in things seen, our hope must be in things unseen, in the invisible world. So all of that works together. Great, you want to do something, you love it, go do it with all of your heart, mind, and soul. But when you get to the end of it, don't lie about the fact that you still feel incomplete. I don't think any discussion with Guy Finley would be complete if we didn't talk about fear. I don't talk about my book at all on this show, but it's about fear, and it's inspired largely by your work. Thank you. My willingness to deal with the fact that I have been terrified <laughs> of many things, <laughs> uh, it, it's been liberating. Yes. To to face my fear, to embrace my fear, to seek it out. You know, well, it's sort of a daisy chain, hand over hand. Well, what's behind this fear? What's in this shadow? Well, what's around this corner that that you're afraid of? And I, I came to understand that, speaking for myself, and maybe a lot of other people, fear is less about danger than simply things they didn't know and understand. And the roots of my fear were not about danger at all, but uh, or or the the external world, but a failure to understand myself. Yes, uh, and so again, it's an inner search. Yes. Really, we yes. we talk about the seeker, the search, and the sacred. Uh, your book and this uh, seminar you're doing, but let's go back to this shadow, this idea of fear. Talk yeah, about because, that because you you, you, you look. You've, you've stated it very, very, very well. And if we continue to at least wish to understand what has always told us what we have to understand if we want to be safe, then we realize that our understanding about how to be safe has nothing to do with safety. And the real root of this thing becomes something, as you said, interior, where I make an, an amazing discovery and I'll just summarize it. There is no such thing as psychological fear without identification. And in the end, all fear is the fear of losing who I am and what I think I done and own. In the end, this is the, Buddha, the great, the four noble truths that Buddha spoke about, that the problem lies in the fact that I, without knowing it, I become attached to something because my identity is the derivative of the image. No image, no identity. Thou shall have no graven images, Looking, referring to this journey. Well, why did God say, why, why is it said no graven images? Because you can't have an image without an identification. That's what an image is, is the narcissist side of the identity connected to it. So here I am, and I don't know it. I'm, I'm brought into this consciousness. That's what it does. It looks for a goal, a place, a thing, someone to be, makes an image of it. And then I wind up being the servant of a mind that can't free itself, but they can only explain why it's not free again. Then I get it. The task is not to run out and find something to be. The task is to bring the light into this being that without understanding it keeps making shadows for me to overcome. What was it? Uh, the uh, Oh, I just blocked on it. That great musical with the, the, you know, the guy with the, uh, the windmill. God, why can't I think of the uh, of that? He, he was always trying to c conquer the dragon that he that that the wind. Oh, uh, Don Quixote. Thank you. The great Don, the chaotic journey, the chaotic journey. We're all yeah. on that because we don't understand what we're trying to slay is something we don't understand about ourselves, and the more we resist it, the stronger it becomes. Yeah, he thought the windmills were giants out there. Yeah. Monsters yeah. out to get them. <laughs> yeah. A mountain out of a molehill. Right? I mean, basically. 
But let's talk about Buddhist philosophy a little bit. Uh, Self-grasping ignorance is a term we hear a lot in uh, all the different uh, yes. variations or iterations of Buddhism. Self-grasping ignorance. Yeah. yeah. And it's sort of a vicious cycle. The self-grasping makes us ignorant, and the ignorance makes us hold on even tighter to this false sense of self. Exactly. And it's not just a spiral, it's a toilet flush. It pulls us down deeper and deeper. It, it, it's the Chinese finger puzzle. You remember where you yeah. put your two fingers in there? Right. And, and why can't you get them out? Because the opposites are working against each other. And the release from the finger puzzle is to push into the resistance, not try to get away from it. And when you do that, the opposites are relaxed, and suddenly you see, well, that's why I was caught. I didn't know the opposites were struggling with each other because I was a part of the game. To see that, I'm out. I heard a teacher say recently, the more you cling to an identity, the more power you give its opposition. Absolutely. That's, Christ said, you can't serve two masters. You'll love one and despise the other. He was speaking of this consciousness that first creates an image out of a desire and then tries to free itself from the fear it has of the thing it wants to make itself whole. So it, it's we, we see this over and over and over. That's why the book, I love this book. It didn't do well in the world, Michael. M many of my books don't, but that's okay because the journey is this discovery that I don't have to prove myself. I have to see myself. There's nothing to do, only something to see. And the clearer that becomes to me, the less I get caught up with this finger puzzle, trying to figure out how am I going to get out of this mess that wouldn't have existed if I hadn't created it to begin with. Well, so the question is, if we, through exercises and a practice of non-attachment, stop clutching and grasping and holding on to this sense that I am a separated self banging around in this meat body in a world of separated form. If I let go of that, what's left? Well, I'll go back to what you said, because we touched on something I think vitally important. What does it mean to be, Eastern terms, mindful? Western terms, to wait and watch, to practice the presence of the Lord. If it is impossible for my own body to hide from a lie that the consciousness that's intended to run that body is telling, then my body is a tell-all. If there is resistance and fear and pain of any kind in it, then it means there is a vast separation between my consciousness and what is above and this body that is the instrument of it below. Now, if that means, simply put this, I reach over, I pick up a hot skillet, I don't need to think to myself a religious, you know, what would Jesus do? I, I drop the skillet because, man, it burns. Same thing. I don't have to practice non-attachment. I have to be present to the pain of attachment when it is presenting itself in me that I can't see yet. My body knows it. My mind doesn't because my mind is attached to the identity produced through the attachment. But not anymore if I practice, stay awake, work to be present, work to be present, remember myself. The more I do that, the more I'm brought into this consciousness that is a singularity and that cannot act against itself. That's how this starts, to see where it is I'm experiencing something I didn't know I'm giving myself and then have the, I'm sorry to use the wrong word, have the courage to enter into that awareness so deeply that I get it. Look, I want what I want, but now I recognize that what I want is part of the pain of why I want what I want. It's a vicious circle. You don't, uh, how do I say it? You step out of the circle, you stop trying to complete it by the mind that creates it. Well, this desire nature that is uh, really, again, the heart and soul of the Four Noble Truths in Buddhism, right. We can see this reflected in the world, what consumerism and the I, me, mind that wants this, that, and the other thing, got to have this, and my life is meaningless without that, is leading to uh, the elimination of species, a lack of diversity, untold cruelty, uh, 
war as if we're still medieval beings? Is this not merely an outpicturing of human consciousness? And further, isn't COVID, given that it's a virus and it has its own reality, I understand that, but as a metaphor, as a reflection, is it not only an indication of a virus within us? Yes. There's no doubt about it, Michael. The world that we see and the way it unfolds is an absolutely perfect reflection of the consciousness that has produced it. There's no getting around it. But we, again, this consciousness that will find an excuse for why the uh, adrenals are pumped in that moment, that consciousness will have explanations. And a lot of them include what we can simply call finger pointing. Everyone else is responsible for the world that I see. Our task as a human being who wants to have any kind of relationship at all with the divine intelligence is to see and beyond the shadow of a doubt. I look out and I see this nightmare taking place, not just in the, in the Ukraine, all over in every border, all over the world. And then I think somehow or other the me that wants that guy who just uh, curb sneaked or cut me off or who's tailgating me, the me that wants to punish him, I think some or other that's unique and only I am entitled to this because th they didn't get the message the freeway belongs to me. That there is always something in us busy separating itself through some form of judgment. And there is no judgment without the sensation of the self making the judgment. So it still comes back to identification. And as the more we see that, the less interested we are, God willing, in being a, a contributor to that world that we see. You can't just step out of it. It's impossible. People get this idea. You, VH used to say, you go, go sit on a mountain someplace and count pomegranate seeds. It's not going to change anything. And self-medication is not the answer to true meditation. The task is to become increasingly conscious of ourselves and to allow the light that shows us the content of our own consciousness to begin this beautiful process of separating the wheat from the chaff. Then, Michael, the world can change because you changed and I changed. And if it's one consciousness, even though it seems like a drop to an ocean, the whole thing has to change. It must. And that's our great responsibility. And you even said it, that it's a strange thing to recognize all of this possibility but to recognize this possibility includes responsibility and most of it I don't want. Because I don't want to give up what I want. I want you to give up what you want. Then we can be on the same page. Yeah, so I can have what I want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Isn't that what every war is, whether it's between husband and wife or countries? I want what I want. There's yeah. a shortage here. You can't have it. So I'm going to overcome you and get it anyway. I've always been amazed in the couples counseling I've done, how much of it comes down to who controls the TV remote. <laughs> oh, God help us. <laughs> um, one of the more pleasurable and beneficial experiences that I've ever had in meditation was watching my thinking mind slow down and an, I can never completely quiet it. I don't suppose anyone ever does. It, uh, it's disgust, like, you have to stop thinking. Well, I, I'm not sure that ever happens. But you can definitely slow it down. Uh, and the gaps between the thoughts open up a little bit. And during that experience, I went maybe two or three seconds without a thought and realized that, I remained aware in spite of having a thought or even a feeling. Yes, yes. I remained. Yes. Michael wasn't there, but something was. Awareness itself. Yes. I was discussing with uh, some of my students the other day this idea of you're not this, you're not that, you're not the separated self. You're not the world, you're not your body, you're not the school you went to, you're not an American, you're not this religion or that gender. Or you are awareness. And so, uh, one of my students said, well, how do I say that to people? <laughs> when they say, who are you? I can't just say, I am awareness. Though 
they're going to think I'm crazy. I guess what I'm asking you, Guy, is we need we need words, I think, to communicate this. We haven't coined the the figures of speech yet to even begin to discuss this. And we look at teachers. Christ admitted up front. He said, "Well, I have to speak in parables." You. You under you wouldn't understand me if I didn't speak in parables. Everything that you said is true, and then I I think to myself, following that line of thought, that maybe that's the. Cause see, I like I I've never considered myself a teacher, not ever. I I think of myself as being a shower, somebody who says, "Will you? Can you see this? Can you see that?" And if you can see this, and if you can see that, that that means that we do have eyes that are in common and a mind that can register the same uh, sympathy. So when a, a man or a woman speaks like you or me speaking, people will be listening to this, they can feel the words. The feeling is far more important than the words. Now, thought is a, a, a very limited tool but when the thought is animated by something that is genuine and true behind thought, then something more than thought is communicated. And then the person feels and hears and thinks along a line that is more unified than just thought by itself. That's the task probably of a teacher, because I wanted to argue with you about something. You said you had maybe three seconds. That's not true. I know that you love nature. I know that when you go into nature, just with myself here in Southern Oregon, there are moments when the mind completely stops because the observer and the observed are no longer apart from each other. There's not the beauty out there and there's not just the recognition of it in the consciousness that outside and that inside are united and in the, the integration of observer and observe, the mind stops because now it doesn't want anything. It is completed by its own awareness of the moment where there's no guy, no Michael thinking, God, this is beautiful. We might mess it up later. But in that moment where you see what you see, boom, it's quiet. And that's the, that's the unity. That's what we're looking for. And we have it in tiny doses. But that gives us a taste that we can't get rid of <laughs> in our heart and mind. Because now I know there is some other relationship that I can have, not just with this nature, with that deer, that mountain, but I'm intended to have that relationship all the time. Even with the shadows, I'm intended to have that relationship where there's no longer me a think thinking about what is this, what do I do with it? There's just the illumination of the fact of myself as it is. I believe in it's kind of, again, uh, synchronicity. I'm working on a talk for the next week. And I, I, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, you know, why couldn't I see this before? When Moses went up on the mountain and the burning bush and Moses said, well, what am I supposed to go tell the people, in, you know, back in Egypt? What am I supposed to say? I met a burning bush and it sent me to free people. And if those of us that know any of the Old Testament, that... The, and it was, by the way, it was the um, the Elohim. It wasn't a man. It wasn't a woman. It was the embodiment of creation said, when you go there, say, I am that I am sent me. I am that I am sent me. And by the grace of God, Michael, because the journey never stops. VH used to say it all the time. I'm receiving the rewards from work I did 30 years ago. I know you know this. All of a sudden, it's so clear. I don't have to think to myself, what am I going to do? I don't have to worry about what's going to take place. There's still that content it wants to stir up. But now it's met with another understanding that everything, and by the way, the actual Aramaic uh, translation of I am that I am, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's an expression that covers I am all that was, all that is, and that will be. In other words, the fulfillment of time. In the fulfillment of time, all of this is done. And if I actually understand all of it's done, then my task is to let it be done in me so that I can participate in that broader body of I am, of the Godhead, of truth. And entering into that, 
There's no fear there. It knows if, if there's fear in Guy, I know that it will be transformed because I'm not going to go in trying to protect Guy. I'm going to let what I need to go do show me Guy so I can be free of him, which is what I want. I don't want Guy in my life anymore, other than I have to play the role as a husband, a, a grandfather. I have a foundation to run, students, but I, I don't want any part of it. I don't want any part of it at all. I want to be as clear as I can be so that every moment of my life with everyone that I'm with, that clarity can be there. And I think that's the real conveyance of this consciousness, clarity. You even said it about VH, clarity, clarity, clarity. Well, I need to uh, acknowledge what you said about nature. You're absolutely right. How quickly we forget. Mm. And that's why I would backpack. And that's why I would backpack alone, even though I knew it was a foolish thing to do. Yes. I couldn't help myself to get, you know, 15 or 20 miles from a road and you come over a hill in the mountains. Yeah. And what you see is so unexpected. Yeah. So breathtaking. <laughs> So perfect, perfect, whatever, whatever it may be, yes. uh, another valley, another hill to climb, another ridge beyond that, a mountain lake, a stream, a porcupine that you suddenly confront on the trail and it scurries off into the bush. You don't judge those things. You don't no. wonder if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Or Exactly, exactly. <laughs> New impression, new impression, new impression, new impression. New receiver, new receiver, new receiver. And the impression and the receiver are not separate things. They are already joined together. And that's what that experience proves. Now, can I take that and bring all of that into my life as an everyday experience where the guy in the supermarket that bumps me with his cart becomes the porcupine? Guy, how can people get more information about you, uh, your books, your webinars, your online presence, and in particular, this event you have coming up in June? First and foremost, just guyfinley.org, G-U-Y-F-I-N-L-E-Y.org. That's the website. You can browse there for years and never expire the material. But if you want to know about the online classes, go to guyfinley.org forward slash classes. And if you want to know about the seminar, you can find out there in the uh, guyfinley.org. And I, there may be a guyfinley.org forward slash journey. I'm not sure if that's true. And I know I'm terrible for not knowing. But you can find out, find out about the event in June. You can find out about the online free webinars. And I urge you to do so. And my, I guess I'm fairly ubiquitous, Michael, on the web uh, with the social net stuff. The kids do that for me. So search it. You'll find it and then we can get together and work as Michael and I have done today. Yeah, just Google Guy Finley, I think. Yeah. You're all over the all yeah. over the internet. Yeah. Hey, I know how busy you are, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, making time for us here today on KPFK. Um, I so value our friendship. I, I think of you also as a teacher. I think in one sense, Everyone is our teacher, yes. especially those who irritate the hell out of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, in the sense of uh, appreciating the work that you've done, the insights. And, you know, it, it's just so wonderful to hear something you think you know reinforced from a completely different perspective or angle. Uh. And then you go, oh, yeah, I think yeah. I knew that. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it, 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 yeah exactly. So, and just so you know, I've, I've missed our time together. I didn't know how much I missed it. So good to be with you again, Michael. I do treasure you. Thank you. Peace, love, and blessings to you and your family. And uh, we'll do it again, I promise. I hope so. You're listening to the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School on 90.7 KPFK in Los Angeles. There's more. We'll be back right after this. Hi, this is Angelique Kijo, and you're listening to People Powered Radio, KPFK 90.7 FM Los Angeles, 98.7 FM Santa Barbara, and worldwide on the web at www.kpfk.org. Peace and love. Well, I want to thank Guy Finley for being our special guest today on this episode of 
the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. He's a special fellow. I've learned a lot from Guy. And uh, you may want to listen to this program a couple of times because he goes fast. And <laughs> it's easy enough to understand if you take it in little bite-sized pieces. In that same sense, I want to remind you in the couple of minutes I have left that we're in our June fun drive and we really need your support. The only way we can stay on the radio is if you support us. We have and never have had in our 62-year history any commercial sponsors. We also, unlike other so-called public radio stations, refuse to take any corporate underwriting. So... More than 90% of what pays the bills here is free will donations from women and men just like you. Community radio means it's your radio station. And to avoid 16 or 17 minutes an hour of dunning commercial announcements designed to dumb you down and make you feel helpless and, and terrified so that you'll use their product or their service. We gave you the facts. And the beauty is it comes from what really amounts to diverse and antagonistic sources. And as consumers of news and information, we have to seek out contrasting opinions and views and information that we know to be factually based. And... What better place to do that than a radio station that has over 100 different programs every week? There's no memo that keeps us on the same page. The only thing that unites the KPFK staff, the the uh, on-air hosts and the producers and, and the management is a progressive outlook, a belief in peace and social justice, a mission statement devoted to building a more perfect union and respecting the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, even though it needs updating, all men are created equal, needs to include people of color and, of course, women. And so it's a living document, this Constitution. But perhaps the cornerstone is the First Amendment, free speech. And that idea merits your support. So point your browser to kpfk.org. If you do that right now, I'll walk you through it. kpfk.org slash donate. That's a shortcut. And in any event, look for support KPFK. Go to Sustainer Circle if you want it to be a monthly pledge. Then you just contribute 20 or $25 a month. It's absolutely painless. It's a tax-free deduction at the end of the year. And... We can count on you to be there. Or if you prefer to make an annual pledge of 150 or $250, you'll find some really nice premiums, some thank you gifts there as well. You can call 818-985-5735. That's 985-KPFK in the 818 area code. It's just a lot easier to go to the website, kpfk.org. Do that now. Make your contribution. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you listening and being a sustaining member of KPFK Community Radio for all of Southern California, streaming for the world at kpfk.org. This program is also on my website, theagelesswisdom.com. We also podcast and post to YouTube. Just search the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. More about me and my free Zoom class at michaelbenner.com. Let me thank my producer, Mark Brisky. Invite you to stay tuned for Carrie Harrison. And as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. From Los Angeles, this is Michael Benner on KPFK. KPFK.